if we haven't met, my name is Wanga, uh, and I'm so excited and nervous. Yeah, so I'm going to sip a little bit of water, because that's what you do when you're nervous. Uh, but yeah, uh, um, we are on a series, and it's called He Gets Us. Um, you would have heard a few weeks ago, Warren did an incredible job uh, sharing the story of Zacchaeus and how Jesus gets us through that story and how we are Zacchaeus in that story and how he invites himself to our houses. And the biggest thing there was that Jesus loves the people that we hate. Uh, that we can go into our world and show off the incredible love of Jesus. How amazing is that? And then last week, uh, we had our very own Craig Clark. <laughs> uh, and you could have seen those tables. And uh, there was a table here and another table here. And how Jesus invites us all, all of us at his table. And how we can also be the same to the people around us and not make excuses, but invite people to the tables to come and experience what we have experienced through Jesus. So he gets us and he gets all of us. In a world where we are trying to, um, to find differences amongst each other and Jesus is pulled into all of this mess, he actually says, I get all of you. And he gets all of us. And today I'm going to say a word and to some of you, it will be like a swear word as soon as I say it. And justice. E. <laughs> <We'll say it's laughs> so that's what I'm going to talk about. But before that, have you ever noticed how we all have double standards? Nah, you don't have them? I think we all have double standards. Not you. Okay. I think you all have it and I'll prove it to us. So this is me. We, have, uh, we play soccer here. Uh, yeah, and it's incredible. And it's, 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 it's fun. But I'm a big sports fan. I love, love sports. Basketball, soccer. Okay, that's it. Um, <laughs> uh, but I can tell you one thing about me. If my team, if my team is losing and, uh, and, and the ref is making calls that are not right or whatever the case is, I'm screaming. I'm like, you are wrong. The ref is wrong. And I'm like, why? That was a foul. And it's just a mess. But if it's the other way around, and my team is winning. Even if it's a foul, I'm like, ah, yeah, I'll find ways to justify it. <laughs> Did you see how you pushed his feet? No, it was his fault. Like, ah, that's me. I'm like, our ref, the ref should be on our side. So that's one of my little double standards. Maybe you have it as well. School. When I was back in school and uh, we were given homework to go do homework and bring back the homework and all of that. When I did my homework, guys, I am ready to tell the teacher Teacher, homework. <laughs> um, but even if I don't, like if the teacher doesn't, uh, remind, doesn't remember the homework, I get so mad. I'm like, I spent all these hours doing my homework, getting ready for class for the teacher to forget that they gave us homework. And I want the teacher to remember. But when I don't do homework, it was a lot of times. I am on my knees, Jesus, please. I don't need the teacher to remember homework today. I'm going to be in so much trouble. I'm like, I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm like, I, I, I am praying for that break to come so that the teacher doesn't remember the homework. Maybe for you, it's when you are in traffic. Uh, oh, we went there. And, and you are in a hurry. Uh, if you are, if someone cuts you off or someone is just speeding, you're like, I can't believe this person. Like, what are they doing? They are like, police, you should get this person and they deserve to be locked in. They deserve the full wrath of the law. Give them a fine, do anything. When it's you, you are just in a hurry to get your kids to school, right? So police, please forgive. Like, <laughs> no wrath, like life is calling. You are faster than the taxi guys. You are like trying to find ways to hit the dust road. It's a whole vibe. The whole point is, I think we all have double standards. I think when it comes to the word justice, when we think of justice, we're like, yes, you deserve justice. You deserve what is coming for you. But when it's ourselves, oh, we need mercy because we are good people. We do good things. Just mercy. It was just this one time. I won't do it again. <laughs> just have some mercy on me, please. We have double standards. We want justice for others, but we want mercy for ourselves. But also the dilemma when it comes to the word justice, 
Even if you love justice and you love mercy, we cannot agree on what, what is just and what is not. You have your definition of justice and I have my definition of justice. You have your cause that you are fighting for and I have my other cause on the side that I'm also fighting for. So we cannot even agree where justice should go or where justice shouldn't. Does that make sense? We cannot even agree on the definition of what justice is at all. And then this week I read Micah 6 verse 8. It's going to be on the screen behind me. And this is what it says. <clears throat> he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. See that word good? Tov? Yeah. He has shown you, man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. But to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk, to walk humbly with your God. What does God require of us? What is good? What is tough? What is God's intended design for us as human beings is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. But how do we do this when we are so divided on what the definitions or what it means to do justice or to love mercy or to walk humbly? Does, walking, does loving mercy mean I just allow people to walk all over me and do whatever I want? It's okay. You're just a human being. Does justice mean the full red? Like we don't know. So we all have to come to this place where we focus it on the word of God and we say, okay, God, how do you define justice? How do you define mercy? And how does it look like for us as followers of Jesus to walk humbly before our God? So I'm hoping in the next few minutes we can agree at least somewhat on uh, a few definitions of what the Bible is saying about this word, okay? Can we do that? Yeah. So, do justice. Okay, what's the word justice here? It's the word mishpat. Say mishpat. Mishpat, mishpat, mishpat whichever one you, 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 you want to call it. It's the Hebrew word mishpat, and what it means is restorative justice. Okay, our worldview of justice is uh, you did something wrong, so it's coming your way, and that's it, you deserve prison, or whatever the case is. This justice here, it's restorative justice. It's about bringing things together. It's about bringing people together. It's about taking what was broken and making it whole again. It's restorative justice. It's meshpet. This is the justice God is calling his people to do. Love mercy. Hey, Mal. Love my mom. <laughs> there she is. Ah, you've just been embarrassed for a few seconds. We love mercy. But it's not talking about my mom. Uh, <laughs> her name is Mercy, by the way. But it's not talking about my mom. The word mercy, yeah, in other, in other translations, it could be compassion. It could be kindness. It's getting what we don't deserve. Actually, in other words, I could say, when it talks about mercy, it's saying, check your heart. Say, check your heart. It's saying, what is inside of you? So you want justice, but what is here? Yeah. Is what is in you, mercy or revenge? Check your heart. So it's love, it's compassion, it's kindness. It's what's in us. We love mercy because we serve a God of mercy. And he says, walk humbly before God. Humility is to think less of ourselves. It's to take the example of Jesus, who, although he was God, he comes down on earth and he, as fully man, as a servant, he walks humbly. That's his um, humility. But also here, yeah, it says walk humbly with our God, with humility towards God. In other words, um, it's submitting to God's idea of justice. It's submitting and obeying God's idea of justice. Because I know you have an idea of justice because I have an idea of justice. And walking humbly means that whatever idea I have of justice, I have to lay it down and submit to God's idea of justice because he gets to define big words like justice. Because if we define them, then we will get confused and we'll end up fighting. But we all come and we say we humble ourselves and we submit to your idea of justice. We realize that when we see justice our way, we have blind spots. We have areas in our lives that we go, yeah, this we can let it slide. And there are other areas where we say, no, 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 this deserves justice. But God's justice does not have blind spots. He sees it all as it should be. And we have to submit to his idea of God's justice. What's the difference here? World justice, God's justice. The world's justice, uh, someone says, restrains behavior temporarily. 
So it's about, oh, let me, let me, let me, if, if, if you do this, you can cover up, basically. Temporarily, you will be better, you will act better, you discipline your kids, they will temporarily be better, and then they, the cycle just continues, or whatever the case is. But God's justice is so much better, because here, injustice, love, and mercy, what it does, when walking humbly, what it does, it, that it changes the heart permanently. So now, how does Jesus get us? If love, if, if Jesus invites us to do justice, to walk humbly, and to love mercy, we have to look at his story and see how he gets us and how he gets this culture that is so divided when it comes to justice. And I'm going to share a story that we find in Luke 23, from verse 26 to 43. But before that, I'm going to give us some context on what happens before this. Are you all still good? Yeah. Are we in agreement? Yeah. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. There was, back then, there was once in a year. Uh, was it once in a year? I could be wrong. Uh, but... They would come, yeah, it was once in a year. Once in a year, uh, Rome, which was the government uh, that was there at the time, would release one prisoner who was set for death sentence. So they would say to the Jewish community, you get to have one prisoner. Uh, this person is going to die, but today we're doing you a favor. This is our justice, which is already flawed. You can see how man's justice is flawed already. But you get to have one person, pick one, and you can have this person. And it happened that on that day, the people that were going to be presented, the people that were going to be presented to the crowd to choose from by Pilate was Jesus and Barabbas. Now let me give you some context here. Jesus, let's start with Barabbas. Barabbas is a thug. He's a rebel and he's a murderer. This is the one person when you go, this person is unjust, you go, this is Barabbas. He's the epitome of unjustness. So Je Je Barabbas is standing there before the crowd and they bring out Jesus. Now, but who is Jesus? As we have learned, Jesus is the one that loves the people we hate. He's the one that invites everyone to a table. He's the opposite of, of what Barabbas is. He's not a thug, he's a defender. He defends the poor. He loves everyone. He's not a murderer, he's a healer. He would touch people that no one would want to touch and he would heal them. So they present Jesus. He's not a rebel. He's son of God who has come for us. So in other words, you have Barabbas who is Ra. By the way, Ra means evil. He's Ra personified. There is Barabbas. And here you have Jesus, who is Tov, personified. And they put them before a crowd of people, a crowd of Jewish people, and they say, okay, this, you get to have a choice today. You can go home and celebrate the one that you set free. Who are you going to choose? Are you going to choose Jesus, the defender? Are you going to choose Jesus, the healer? Are you going to choose Jesus, the one that loves everybody? Or are you going to choose Barabbas, the murderer, Barabbas, the thug, the Barabbas, the rebel against Rome, you decide. Are you going to choose Tov or are you going to choose Ra? And they say, we want Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. And here's the thing. As much as you might want to fight it as much as you want, the reality is when it comes to us human beings, when we are presented with good, and evil, we will choose evil. Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. And then they take Jesus, Son of God, has never done anything wrong, an innocent man. They drag him in the streets in front of everybody. They take him and they put him on a cross. And on the cross, that's where we find the story in Luke 23. There's two men, and he's the man in the middle. On one side, there's a criminal. And on the other side, there's another criminal. 
There's a man in the middle. And I want you to see how Jesus experiences injustice. But watch how the story unfolds for our good. The man on the one side, we don't know which side, he stands and he looks at Jesus and he starts saying this to him, Jesus, you are the son of God. Save yourself. Get out of that cross. You can save yourself if you are really who they say you are. And me. He didn't forget that part. What he really meant is save me, Jesus. I want to get out of this. I deserve this, but I should get out of it. Please save me. Jesus doesn't say anything at that point. The man on the side, I don't know what's happening to his heart. Is he having a change of heart? What's going on? And he watches and he looks past Jesus and he watches the man that's shouting back and he says, do you not fear God? Don't you realize that we are getting what we deserve? We deserve what is coming our way. This man that stands in the middle of us is completely innocent. Don't you see? We are treated justly. We are getting what we deserve. And what's happening in the crowd? Let me go this way. <laughs> what's happening in the crowd? People are watching as this story unfolds. A whole lot of people. You have the soldiers. You have the soldiers. And they decide this is a very small knife, but it's sharp. You have the soldiers. And they are looking at Jesus on the cross. He's the man in the middle. He's become the center of attention. They're going, is this your guy? Is this it? He's the one that's supposed to save you? Is this the king that you guys spoke of? The one that's on the cross? They are mocking him. They're throwing jokes at him. This your king? Let him save himself. And the people in the crowd, yeah, save yourself, Jesus. Save yourself. Get out of that cross. Save yourself. It's a whole crowd. He's being mocked still. Jesus still on the cross in anguish and in pain. This is injustice. This man does not deserve to be here. He's done nothing wrong. You can imagine. What about his friends? What about those that walked closely with him? In the crowd, there's Mary Magdalene. Now Mary is the woman that Jesus freed from demons. Maybe she knew what it was like to be tormented for years and years of pain, of suffering. She's looking at her friend, the one that healed her. She's in pain. Oh, Jesus the reality that she's about to lose him. So on the crowd, there's Mary, Jesus' mother. She would have seen him grow up. In fact, she saw him open his eyes for the very first time. Did she know this day was coming? Did she know that this was what was meant? A teacher once said to her, that it will feel like a sword is being pierced right into her heart. Oh, the pain she could have been feeling in that moment as she watches her son. This is my son. This is my son. You're screaming king of the Jews? This is my son. This is my son. This is my son. I didn't plan this. But can I speak to some single moms? I was raised by a single mom, by the way. And she's there. She's incredible. Here's what my mom would tell you. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. That Jesus gets her is that Jesus gets her. In the moment when Jesus was on the cross, he also looks at the crowd. He sees his friend John. And he says, John, that's your mother now. 
Do you have this? That's your mom. She would say, I think my mom would say this, Jesus gets me. I didn't know how to raise two boys. I don't know how to raise two boys. When he was young, Jesus, God, put aunties, grandparents, uncles around him to support, to help him grow. As he grew older and he decided that he wants to go away from Jesus and do his own thing and live his own life, Jesus would send a friend, a brother, to show him how God is like. Any single moms in the house? Just raise your hand if you're here. I want to tell you, Jesus gets you. He gets you. He knows your pain. He knows your struggles. He knows the fights you have with your kids. He knows that you're trying to raise two boys on your own and it's a struggle. And I've, I'm trusting this. He will put community and people around you to say, to show you that he gets you. Maybe you are a testimony of that. You are not alone. Jesus gets us. In the middle of injustice, Jesus does justice. He says, John, this is your mother. He doesn't leave her alone. Jesus gets us. I had more, but I'm not going to continue that road. Let me continue. So Jesus is here. He's the man in the middle. Everyone is looking as this injustice around us is happening. A man who has never committed any wrong is punished, being punished. What should he say? What would you say? I know what I would say. I know what I would do if I was the creator of the universe with all the power. But Jesus looks at the crowd, at the soldiers, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Why is forgiveness so important in this story? Here's how Tim Keller puts it. He says, there can be, it might be on the screen behind me, there can be no true justice without forgiveness. Without properly understanding that relationship, people will continue to seek vengeance. He said, and vengeance always goes past justice. If you want justice, what the Bible tells us, as we use that as our measure, we need to forgive. We need to come to a place where we need to forgive. I want to talk to you. He gets you. He gets your pain. He gets your anguish. He gets that you have been hurt. But he is inviting you to freedom, to get out of the prison of unforgiveness. Jesus, in the middle of injustice, he could have chosen vengeance and said, all of this to my enemies or whatever the case might have been, but he says, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Maybe Jesus is inviting you to forgive today. Maybe he's inviting you to forgive those that have hurt you, that have caused you pain. Maybe you've been wanting vengeance, but I'm hoping that Jesus is doing something in your heart because he has forgiven us as we're going to see as how this story unfolds of our sin. We forgive because of who God is. We forgive because as he has been to me, I want to be to others. That's the message of the gospel. Justice without forgiveness is revenge. Now, oh, I told you he, lo- he told John to look after his mother. And Jesus looks at the criminal, the one that stands here and says to the other criminal on the side, you are getting, we are getting what we deserve. And in a few words of desperation, this criminal says to Jesus, would you remember me? Could you remember me? Would you? Please, I know I am getting what's coming my way. I know I deserve to be on the cross, but would you remember me? And Jesus looks at him and he says, today you will be in paradise with me. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. When we humble ourselves before God and we say, Jesus, I recognize that my idea of justice is flawed, that what I want is revenge, but would you remember me, Jesus? When we do that, 
Jesus says you have been forgiven. You are a son. You are a daughter. You are loved. And you get to be part of my kingdom. You get to build a future with me. This is the gospel. This is the good news that justice has come. And it personifies mercy. And it cannot be as humble as Jesus is. But we can humble ourselves and seek the forgiveness of our sins before Jesus. He gets us. All of us. We are all at the cross. We are all at the cross. He gets our anger. Our anger at government, at institutions, at the education. He sees it all. He gets our anger. He gets that we are mad and we want things to change and we want justice. We are all in the crowd shouting, justice. He gets us. He gets our pain. He gets the pain of a friend who's lost a brother, who's lost another friend. He gets the pain of a mom. He gets the pain of a dad. He gets the pain. He gets all our pain, the pain that has come to us because of abuse or whatever it may be. He gets us, and we are all at the cross. He gets that we carry guilt of what could have been, the shame of what we should have done. Maybe there's regret in the house. You saw injustice happen and you didn't do anything. I'm pretty sure there were people in the crowd that saw this happen and they would have wanted to do something, but they didn't do anything. And he says, I get you. I know what it's like. I've experienced injustice happen around me and I felt young and powerless. I didn't know what to do. But I know he gets me. He knows I carried regret and I'm so grateful that he gets to walk with me and show me what it's like to experience what he has for me. Are you in pain? Are you in guilt? Are you in anger? Are you in regret? Are you in all of them? He gets you. He gets all of us. Jesus knows that we are both the aggressor and the victim. See, when it comes to injustice, it's easy. Well, not easy, but we almost see ourselves on the one side. Or we go, I'm just the victim of what has happened to me. And it's real. You've experienced pain. You are hurt. We've been... We feel broken, we feel stolen from, we feel abused by our government, we feel abandoned, we feel robbed of life. But we are also the aggressor. See, the problem we see around us, we can blame God as much as we want, but the reality is that we know deep down it is the extension of the human heart It's the evil that is in us. We cause the pain. We are the aggressors. We are the soldiers. We are the people with with swords in our hands ready to poke fun at Jesus and mock him and mock his justice. He gets us. We are the aggressors. We cause the pain that we see around us. Could it be that the gospel is good news for both the aggressor and the victim. Could it be that the gospel is our only hope? Could it be that it's only through the gospel that we can do justice, that we can love mercy, that we can walk humbly before God? The gospel is good news for you. The gospel says no matter what you have done, no matter what pain you have caused, no matter what hurt you have created, no matter how much chaos is around your world, that is directly because of what you have done. Have you abandoned your kids and you feel regret and shame? Whatever it may be, wherever you might be at, the gospel says you can be made right with God. No one is too far. No one is too far gone. You are loved. You are a son. Would you humble yourself and come to him and experience mercy? That's the gospel. That's the gospel. But could it be also that the gospel is for the victim as well? Are you looking for justice somewhere else? Is it maybe the politician? Is it the lawyer? Could it be that the man in the middle that stands between these two criminals says, I know what it's like to experience pain? to the greatest degree possible. I was the victim of injustice. I get you. Could it be that your hope 
for wholeness, for healing, is the gospel. It's when you come to Jesus and he says, lay it all at my feet. Come see me for who I am and I will make you whole. I will heal you. This is how supernatural the gospel is. That there is no pain that Jesus cannot heal. There is no shame that Jesus cannot heal. This is the gospel. In other words, let me summarize it this way. What's happening at the cross as the band comes up. The story of a judge. Story of a judge who had a son. And the son had, created, had committed a crime. He had stolen. And he had to pay a ridiculous amount of money that he couldn't pay. Couldn't afford. And he stands before a judge. He looks at the judge. And the case has been made. And the judge says, Guilty. You have to pay the price. You are guilty. You have to pay the price. Justice needs to happen. But the judge takes off his robe. He walks down to the sun. Out of his own wallet, he says, paid in full. I'm going to pay it. That's justice and mercy and humility. That's justice, that's mercy in humility. The one that had all the position in the world takes off his robe. Jesus, he comes down from heaven to earth into our brokenness, into our mess. This is the judge. He comes. He takes off his robe. He says, you are guilty. All of us are guilty. In humility, he takes off his robe. He walks up to us. Messy says, I'll pay. Justice, messy, and humility.